Um, no, thank you all so much, Simon's family, for blessing us with this great rendition of Let Freedom Ring. This morning, as we prepare to celebrate our nation's birth and our nation's heritage, I wanted to bring up a personal comment. Someone asked me, where is patriotism in the Bible? Where do you find that? And you know, I believe patriotism is found in the Bible, but that's the wrong question. The right question is, where does God say that he has a plan for us? And what does that mean for Americans and America? And so I'd like to have as our verse of scripture today, this verse under the title, America the Beautiful, God's Providential Plan for the USA. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And of course, our iconic mountain out west is Pikes Peak for our country. And you may say, well, why is that? Well, first of all, I have to say, this is the kind of view CJ and I had for a number of years as we looked out our window in Woodland Park, Colorado. But Pikes Peak is more than just the peak there. It is the Gateway 14er, 14,000 feet high, 14,111 by measure. But I want to talk about something you may or may not have heard of. Did you know that there is a race, a car race, called the Pikes Peak Hill Climb? And this course begins at about 9,300 feet in elevation and goes up 156 turns, 12 and a half miles, up 4,700 feet, and it only takes about eight minutes for them to make this up there. Now, when I drove up there, it took me about an hour and a half. <laughs> but you can see here one of the race cars above the clouds doing the race for the top to reach the summit. And they do this every year at this time of year. As a matter of fact, they just completed it a couple of weeks ago. But I want to talk about an even more incredible ascent to the summit that we can talk about today. And that was made by a small, frail woman named Catherine Lee Bates. We just sang a few moments ago the song that she created called America the Beautiful. This was in 1892. You can see they had to do that whole ride. It took half a day. They took that whole ride up where the, the race now happens on horseback in order to get up there. And not only that, but the ladies that you see in this picture did it side saddle the whole way up there. Now, Catherine Lee Bates was a congregational minister's daughter. And she was a professor at Wellesley College. And she was on a summer program to Colorado Springs to visit the colleges and to visit the area and to encourage Christianity in the West in 1892 when she climbed up on horseback to the summit of Pikes Peak. And of course, we won't read all the words, but you can see she wrote all the things that she saw up there, plus she did a review of American history. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet under God's provincial plan whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. And then she goes on 
to say how wonderful it is to be in a free country. And she says, America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crowned thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Catherine Lee Bates. After she returned to her room in the Antlers Hotel that night, she remarked to friends that countries such as England had failed because while they may have been great, they had not been good and that unless we are willing to crown our greatness with goodness and our bounty with brotherhood, our beloved America may go the same way. Quite a wise woman, wouldn't you say? Now let's talk about God's providential plan. I'm going to take you through a really fast history lesson that is true history you will not hear from very many people in this day and age. The first landing of Englishmen is what we're talking about because we are most of us descendants of the uh, folks from the English Isles and who speak English. So that is most apropos for us. As we look at it, the first landing was on Virginia Beach in 1607. Today there is this monument that stands on Virginia Beach, just up from the beach, that signifies this landing in 1607. You've probably heard that from your history books at one time or another. But more than that, and I know this is a lot to read, but this is key. This is crucial. So let's read it together about American history. This is when they landed, Pastor Robert Hunt, an Anglican pastor, was on that ship specifically asked for by the king to be on that ship. And he said, once they landed and erected a cross, he said, we do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to raise up godly generations after us and with these generations take the kingdom of God to all the earth. May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations as long as this earth remains and may this land along with England be evangelist to the world. May all who see this cross remember what we have done here and may those who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant and in this most noble work that the Holy Scriptures may be fulfilled from these very shores the gospel shall go forth to not only this new world but the entire world. That's quite a dedication of the first Englishman who came to this country. But... There's more. We can go back another generation. And in the mid-1500s, rustic, and I call them rustic because they weren't from the cities. They were from the hills and the dales and the valleys and the hintermost parts of Scotland where they had been driven to because of their faith. Rustic Scots Christians were ensconced in the upper east coast of New Armorica. Their families had come originally from northern France, which at that time was called Armorica. And they settled eventually in Scotland, but because of persecution and trouble based on their biblical beliefs, they had to flee Scotland even to Iceland and then from there they had to flee to Greenland and from there they came to Newfoundland in America and by the mid-1500s they were living there as many many families and they called it New Armorica. Sound vaguely familiar? And so they had come through and established Christianity even before the Virginia Beach landing even before the pilgrims landed. They brought their holy Bibles with them and studied and decided they were going to go to the Indians and the Eskimos with freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. In the year 
1562, just after that time, during this time, a group of French Huguenots, French Anabaptists, seeking a haven from Catholic persecution, made a settlement in Beaufort, North South Carolina, and their descendants are still there today. So this is once again a generation before the pilgrims came. In the year 1608, the pilgrim Baptists, separatists, were harassed by religionists and civil government for their biblical worldview. And in 1618, King James decreed that nonconformists, which were, became the pilgrims, must leave England. By 1620, with God's grace, they sailed for America. So in 1620, the pilgrims landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts and never looked back to the homeland they had left because of the persecution from there. That's why they didn't bring the King James Bible to America. They didn't want the king's version of the Bible. They wanted the Geneva Bible, which was a much less political document. So they brought the Geneva version. This here is a, is a copy of, or is a picture of the Bible that they brought. And by all of their notes, it was a Geneva Bible. The king had persecuted them. The king's men had harassed them, had taxed them mercilessly just because of their religion. Why would they bring his Bible to America? They said in their Mayflower Compact, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in ye northern part of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic Anno Domini 1620. You'll notice there what they're saying is all about this journey that they're on is for the glory of God, to spread his gospel, to have a country where free men and women and families exist. And they had the first Thanksgiving. They were pilgrims, not Puritans. Now, I'm sure, since I preached on it before, you all remember that there's a difference between pilgrims and Puritans. Puritans were people who wanted to purify the Church of England from the inside. They were fighting to purify. They were zealots for purifying the church. The pilgrims were Anabaptists who did not want to purify uh, the religion of England, they wanted to just be Bible people with no outside interference from the government. And so these were pilgrims that were separatists that were Bible-believing Anabaptists who, you know what Anabaptist refers to, Anna in the Greek means re or to do again. So Anabaptist means to baptize again. In those days and in that age, children were baptized when they were first born. But the Baptist said, no, the Bible teaches us that a person must make a choice for Jesus Christ. And babies can't make the choice for Jesus Christ. And so since most people are already baptized. We're going to re-baptize them when they decide they're going to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That were the pilgrims. Those were the Baptists of the day. And so in the 1600s, the Puritans came more and more and more because they themselves were starting to be persecuted in King James, England. And they immigrated once the foothold had taken hold on this soil. And so the Puritans came and they were actually coming up against the Bible pilgrims. And they were saying, no, no, no. You've got, we left this 
monarchy behind, but we're creating another religious monarchy here. And you've got to go with what we say as we purify what we're doing as far as religion is concerned. And the pilgrims said, no, 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 that's not the point. You're, you're, you're becoming what you fled. And so they separated themselves from them. So you had the English under the crown, and you had the Huguenots, and you had the Armoricans, the Puritans, and the Pilgrims. The first Baptist colony was the colony of Rhode Island. It's the, it was the first to declare independence of all the colonies. Rhode Island stepped up and said, we're tiny, but we're bold, and we're going to be the first ones to declare independence. And they did so. That was the Baptists. They were from the town of Providence, Rhode Island, which is now still the capital of the state of Rhode Island. And this is their flag. And the flag says, hope, hope in the Lord, hope in Providence. As freedom goes throughout this land. As a matter of fact, one of those people that you may not have heard of before is Dr. John Clark. He was a Baptist and a physician. And in 1644, he founded the First Baptist Church of Newport. Now, this is a sister church of the First Baptist Church of Providence, led by Roger Williams. You may hear that Roger Williams is like the uh, founder of the Baptist Church in America. This is the First Baptist Church in 1639. But in 1644, his friend, Dr. John Clark, started another First Baptist Church in Newport. But in 1651, he was imprisoned by Massachusetts Puritans for seeking freedom of religion for all. He had, with several other men, he had gone into the environs of uh, Massachusetts that was in the hills and dales and started preaching Bible instead of purifying themselves uh, in the Lord. And um, they arrested him for being for coming across the border and preaching. And so uh, he said, it's not the will of the Lord that anyone should have dominion over another man's conscience. Well, isn't that what we believe today? But that's not what the Puritans believed. That's a sermon for another day. In 1652 through 1663, it took over a decade for him to go back to England to lobby royalty and English parliament for a separate colonial charter and he received it in 1663 for Rhode Island. And so the powers that be, including the Puritans and others that were against the pilgrims, he used their own um, organization against them and lobbied the king and the king decided to give them a separate charter. And in 1664 through 1676, he preached, served as physician, and elected, was elected as deputy governor of Rhode Island for three terms. He was a Baptist. So what you had all along the coast was God's plan coming into effect. The Armoricans in the north, and, of course, you always had the French who were constantly wanting to pilfer America for gain. Take the, the um, furs and take all of the goodness from the north and export it to Europe. And the, you had the English that were searching for gold and were searching for uh, tobacco and searching for other things that they could send back to England to pilfer basically the new world. But then you had all of these others that were Christians who had come believing they were part of God's plan. And Oglethorpe was one of those people in the 1730s and 40s. Oglethorpe came from England with some Anabaptists from Europe and he started what little colony that we're all kind of a little bit familiar with? 
Georgia. Georgia at that time went all the way from Savannah to the Mississippi River. And it was a huge, the, the most huge state colony of them all. And later it was split up into what we know as Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. But, you know, we used to own them. <laughs> just uh, crimson tide. <laughs> just go right on out. Uh, so, the, the reason Oglethorpe was given such, test, such great territory was because the Spanish king had come in. And he was in Florida and had all of his um, servants and his soldiers there and they were trying to take over all of this land and the king gave Oglethorpe and you can find this this actual statue of Oglethorpe's uh, coming and coming this far, right down here in Jasper, a few miles away from here, they've got a big obelisk there with a testimony about how far Oglethorpe came uh, and where his uh, area was to work all of this land in the name of the king and to protect this border against the Spanish down in Florida. Now, an interesting thing about Oglethorpe he forbade slavery in any of these towns and cities in this area. He said, I'm a Bible man, I'm a Baptist and a Baptist, and I believe that the Bible does not condone slavery. So for the first few generations of our country's heritage, there was no slavery in this whole area that is so much became the Old South. And so as you're seeing all this develop from Europe coming to the U.S., you have the Armoricans, which became the Presbyterians, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Baptists, the Quakers, the Dutch Reformed, the Anglican, the Huguenots, and the Anabaptist Baptists were all along here, and Spain had fled by that time in 1776. Well, do you see something that's happening there? These people weren't just mercenaries that were out for what they could get and that were going to be gone. They were people who came with a vision for a new country that was under God and under freedom. And it was peppered all through these colonies by 1776. As a matter of fact, only two nations on earth have been founded in the name of religious freedom specifically. They are Israel and the United States of America. Look that up. The national motto of the United States remains, In God We Trust. This is not a generic universalist term, but refers to the Christian God. Our founders referred to the Christian God in that God we trust. And then, finally, the capstone of the Washington Monument contains the Latin words, Laus Deo, praise to God. This was placed in reference to the Christian God and his son, Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, if you've got a $1 bill in your wallet, which is about all I have, um, but if you have a $1 bill in your pocket, you'll notice it has on the back of it a, the seal of the United States of America. And you can see that the seal here is the front of our national seal, not the back of it. This is the front because underneath it, you'll notice on your dollar bill, it says... The great seal of the United States. And so this is the front of our great seal. So we need to know what it means. It says annuit captus, which means we are favored undertakings of divine providence. And it has 13 levels, 13 strong entities united from, this is Roman numerals here, 1776 and underneath Novus Ordo Seclorum which means a new order of the ages not under a monarchy but under a republic under God no more 
French monarchy telling people what they are supposed to believe. No more English monarchy. No more Spanish monarchy telling people what they're supposed to believe. It was a new order of the ages. This is a background of some of our most prominent founding fathers. Someone has gone to the trouble of collecting all of their sayings from the National Library of Congress. And they found that there are 3,154 political statements by these men. Political statements, not sermons, not theological statements, but political statements about the founding of our country. 34% have direct quotes from the Bible. 34%. The majority of the colonies established the Bible as their rule book for public affairs and all of them limited the federal government in state affairs. Oh, Hmm, has there been any encroachment since then on state affairs from the federal government? Leviticus 25.10 is on our liberty bell at the top of the Independence Hall. Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. Our Declaration of Independence. We hold independence. We hold these truths to be self-evidence that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Truth created by a creator. Can you mistake what the writers of our Declaration of Independence stated? I don't think so. All 50 states contain words in their preamble expressing praise or reliance upon Almighty God, all 50 states, even Hawaii. In the last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, there is this phrase. We, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Can you mistake it? They signed this on penalty of death. Bringing it to a close now, we're very close, so stay with me. The Federalist Papers, which were the original interpretation of what the Constitution framers meant, states, in the Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution nor prohibited it by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, which means religious and moral matters should be left up to the states and their voting people. Has there been any encroachment on that for the state of Georgia? So, in finishing up, we have to be proud of being Baptists in America. We're the originals. Everybody else has come later and has not done it any better. May those come who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant and in this most noble work that the Holy Scriptures may be fulfilled. From these very shores the gospel shall go forth to not only this new world but to the entire world. And that's what we've done. We are historically a Christian nation. We are not a Christian nation by edict, as some would think, or some would even want, but by freedom. And we have gone to the whole world and continue to go to the whole world, and that is why the Lord still protects us. And why we pray that he will continue to protect us so that we can send the message of the love of God through Jesus Christ 
to all the world. Next week, we're going to resume our study of Acts. And so, if you'll read chapter 9, you'll be caught up with that. But let me say, please understand your history. This is true history. I've spent many years putting this together and understanding so much more in so much more depth than this. And so, uh, we'll study some more as we go along in the weeks and months. But be proud. Celebrate the 4th of July as brotherhood united in the states of America. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this history lesson of your great plan that is ongoing for your church and your people to be a part of going to all the world. And the only way that that happens is the freedom to do so. Thank you for our freedom of religion. Thank you for our freedom in law. And thank you for our freedom to love others. In Jesus' name, amen.